The mission of the Inattentive ADHD Coalition is to ensure that children with inattentive ADHD are diagnosed by the age of 8 and that adults with inattentive ADHD receive prompt and accurate diagnosis when seeking help. To learn more about our mission and how you can help, visit iadhd.org. I'm so delighted that you've joined us. I'm Linda Rogley with the AD Diva Network, which works with ADHD women 40 and better. We have two esteemed physicians with us today to talk about later life diagnosis and how that intersects with inattentive ADHD. I'm going to let them introduce themselves and then we'll jump into some questions that I hope will be really helpful if you are a later life diagnosis or considering seeking one. Oren, would you go first? Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Oren Mason. I'm a family physician in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I was diagnosed with ADHD when I was 42. My practice is entirely ADHD now. Mm. Since 2000, I've seen only patients with ADHD, mm -hmm. which is thousands and thousands. We treat actively about 1,200 patients right now wow. of all ages. We know that ADHD is generally based on genetics and neuroreceptor physiology and any diagnosis is almost too late because it's always been there. Now we're going to focus on diagnosis at a later age, but I just want to point out that there's no such thing as an ideal age for diagnosing ADHD. Yeah. Yeah. There's an old African proverb, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The next <laughs> best time is today. <laughs> I, love that. I think that's when we should be diagnosing ADHD 20 years ago, but if not then, today. Let's do it now. So we'd like to talk about the late life diagnosis of ADHD. When we meet a 40-year-old just diagnosed with ADHD, there's an awful lot of ADHD story prior to that. We're not going to limit our stories. Absolutely. Dr. David Pomeroy, would you introduce yourself, please? Certainly. I'm also a family physician. I've been in practice since 1979, so I did 26 years of general family medicine. And probably for five years before I left that, I became more interested in ADHD, probably because I was diagnosed with ADHD at age 51. Yeah. I opened my practice exclusively ADHD in 2005, nice. so past 17 years and thoroughly enjoy it. Coming off my own experience, I was a clinic chief in one of the University of Washington primary care clinics. I had to keep track of managing business numbers, personnel, making agendas for weekly meetings, running weekly meetings. I would walk into a weekly meeting, think, oh yeah, agenda. wonder what we're going to talk about. <laughs> Get up the monthly report of numbers and think, oh yeah, okay. Looks good because that was boring. I'd get an interruption on something about the clinic when I was trying to do clinical practice. And then it was hard to get back to where I was shifting from one thing and another. Planning, being organized, easily distracted by a task that was easy to do instead of working on the one that really needed to be done. Missing deadlines, all those kinds of things. Procrastination is a huge one. I think pretty much anybody who doesn't in some definition of procrastination doesn't have ADD. <laughs> I don't think it's possible. I don't think so either. Is there anything you win that or? Right. Well, I, every presentation of ADHD is different. Whenever we run through this list, there's always exceptions to every rule. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I just diagnosed somebody last week who actually doesn't procrastinate. It's mm -hmm. a child with ADHD, inattentive, not hyperactive, but so much anxiety so much of ADD is accompanied by anxiety, but this young man has more than most, and so he actually doesn't procrastinate. People who don't have ADD say they're procrastinating when they finish at the last minute. People with ADD say they're procrastinating when we start at the last minute. <laughs> That's the key difference. There's always some episodes of not inattention that confuse people and make it hard to make the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Kids and teenagers so often we hear, you can pay attention to video games. I know it's not an attention problem. Right. Yeah, silly. The inattention that we're referring to is cognitively driven inattention. It would be important or prudent to do something at this time. Not urgent, because urgency is an emotional value. The interest. With ADD, we, we can do time stuff that's urgent. That's why procrastination is a good solution, actually. Do it when you have the energy. But people who don't have ADD can do part of it when it's sensible and the rest of it when urgency gives you that little push. Absolutely. Inattention is a poor word. It's difficulty controlling attention yep. and maintaining attention for adult purposes, which is why we see so much more of it in adults. That quote Russell Barkley, that self-regulation is the primary issue, Absolutely. regulating 
time management, regulating attention, regulating emotions, all of those kinds of things. When there's something that's more interesting or perceived to be easier, then that's where the attention goes. And that's where distractions come in. And you mentioned the word inconsistency. Sometimes we can do something and sometimes we can't, which does make it difficult even for a trained professional to recognize what's going on. The other piece that I heard was ADHD is a disorder of extremes. Sometimes we're procrastinating, sometimes we're just right on top of it. That goes right back to consistency. Also, both of you mentioned anxiety as being part of this. What happens with people who are diagnosed later in life? For instance, I was diagnosed in my late 40s probably had something to do with hormones, but I was diagnosed years ago with depression. What happens with folks with inattentive ADHD back in the day, then they know something's not right, but maybe misdiagnosed. I think that anxiety and depression between the two of them, most common co-occurring conditions, anxiety a little bit higher than depression. Anxiety and depression usually comes about because of the struggle with ADHD symptoms. Sometimes it is actual generalized anxiety disorder, a fear of impending doom, something bad's going to happen, even though everything's fine right now. Many people I see will say they're on an SSRI for anxiety, and they'll say, it it just seems like there's something more. There's got to be more to it. They just know something else is there. Then they tumble to the ADD part when their child is diagnosed, and they're thinking, Uh, that sounds a lot like me, uh, or someone else says, we may want to look at ADHD. I was told, oh, you got through college. You couldn't have ADD. If you were really interested in getting a degree in that field, you have no trouble. I think the anxiety and depression often come about in later life because of the struggles of ADHD. And one easy demonstration of that, they get on the right medication. They're starting to use different strategies and they don't need anxiety med anymore. Got it. So sometimes it's which came first, the chicken or the egg, the ADHD or the anxiety, depression. And there are other things that coexist with ADHD. Can you talk about that? Anxiety is always got to be one of the big discussions. It's present in various 40, 60, sometimes even higher percentages Mm -hmm. of adults with ADHD. Mm -hmm. I think we cultivate it. I think we get good at having anxiety. We live on edges. Mm -hmm. Anxiety Mm -hmm. works. Yeah. Yeah. In any other discipline, we would think of anxiety as psychic pain. Mm. But if procrastination is the only reliable way to get your homework done, because you will have energy for it in the class before. Yeah. And if you always have energy to do a paper or complete a project at the last minute, then literally banking on anxiety is collecting it until there's enough to do the job. People with ADHD have a remarkable ability to endure psychic pain in order to stay productive. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that it's fair to say that people with ADHD cultivate depression. I think depression comes from living with ADHD. It's more experiential, Mm -hmm. more passive. I I don't think people fail to try, fail to shoot for the stars, fail Mm -hmm. to dream. But discouragement after discouragement takes its toll. There's probably some mindfulness and healthy living practices that we're just not good at, that we could do that would decrease the high rate of depression diagnoses too. But depression is a very common diagnosis. And it's not a diagnosis, but shame. Uh, is yeah. Shame overload disorder or something to that effect. I don't know if it's a diagnosis, but it should at least be in counseling circles because shame is such a prominent experience for people with ADHD. Mm-hmm. I don't think we cultivate shame, but we maintain an incredible database oh, yeah. of how shaming life can help us stay productive. Even if your parents were good parents, you need the library of all the most terrible things they've said reverberating in your brain to help you not do it again. And once they s- stop saying things to us, we start saying things to ourselves. You can see children taken out of a game after an infraction or a bad play will sit there and shame themselves trying not to do it again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if I get breaking in terms of shame, and I forget where I read this, when shame is involved, observations are taken as value judgments. Ah, wow. Someone can observe, you know, you know, didn't do that or whatever. And 
it triggers the shame of I'm bad. It's mm -hmm. not that someone else is saying you're bad, but I feel it internally. I'm a bad person. I'm defective because I didn't do that. That's the danger of shame. We have this negative talk. And that is absolutely one of the things that need to be addressed. It hides under the radar, maybe even more than ADHD. Someone is diagnosed at later life, then therapy around shame is an important part of helping those people. What do you hear from people when they finally hear it's ADHD? Is it like a sigh of relief or is it a kick in the pants? How do people react? And, and most people are happy for the diagnosis, especially if it answers a lot of questions that have just been unanswered for years. Wow. Yeah. yeah, it's easy to imagine that 40, 50, 60 year olds have lifetimes of questions that need to be answered, but so do seven year olds. Ah. Understanding why things are difficult or why things that have gone the way they've gone. Making mm -hmm. sense of the world is the relief at any age. The people in whom it's a letdown, a disappointment, are people who have a good chance of getting past that because they're probably operating on a notion of ADHD that doesn't realize how treatable it is. Some people refer to the confusion of therapies, but I think of it as a world of additively helpful therapies. Mm -hmm. You don't have to choose between a therapist and medication. You probably need both. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to pick between diet and sleep regimen. They both help. You can't exercise enough to do what medications do, but you can have what exercise does for your brain. And you can have what medications do. You mm -hmm. can have what sleep does. And you can have what meditation does. You can have it all. We, have we've got this it. richness of ways to treat ADHD. If you're not looking for a quick, easy one-off, the relief for most people really weighs more than disappointment that there's something wrong. David, what do you have to add? The relief is helpful. Oh, that explains it. Yeah. I also think then people come out of that with two different reactions. Some people see as a, this is a terrible burden. I've got this thing I have to deal with all the time. It's a terrible condition. They're just focusing on how bad their life is because they have ADHD. Yeah. And other people are relieved, happy to find out, okay, now I know there's a name to what's going on there are things I can do. Or they say, great, what can I do? And ask me. What well, about the people who are pretty mad about it, though? How come not, this wasn't figured out? I could have done fill in the blank. Yeah, that shows up also later after the relief. People are angry. One patient is still angry at her parents because she was diagnosed. And her mother said, I'm not going to have any kid of mine taking stimulants. <gasps> Ooh. So I made her diagnosis when she was age 50. She started her own business. She's a therapist, feels great about herself. She said, I can get in the car and my husband doesn't cringe because he <laughs> figures we're going to get to where we're supposed to and we're going to get there on time. One story I'll relate from another physician in the area here he always asks parents after second or third visit with kids, how did you feel when you took the medicine? <laughs> One guy said, I love to play the violin. I hate to practice. Yeah. I started taking that stuff and I was practicing every day. Imagine yeah. where I could have been if I was taking that from childhood. Both of you have alluded to this, that if we diagnose, the earlier you're diagnosed, the better. So what's the danger in waiting for a later life diagnosis? Not that you shouldn't do it, but what's happened in the meantime? What comes up for me, shame, there's low self-esteem, there's that self-hatred. What has built up? I've mentioned a couple. I'm sure there are more. The biggest one, particularly for teens, uh, mm -hmm. but people of any age, are the risk factors like two to four times the incidence of a car accident, oh. sometimes the risk of contracting a sexually transmitted disease, mm -hmm. 10 times the risk of being involved in an unwanted pregnancy. Yeah. Substance abuse goes through the roof. Mm -hmm. So depending on the studies, three to five times higher rate of substance abuse in teens not treated for AD. Yes. Kids who started medication at age eight, nine, 10, they have the same risk as everybody else. Mm. Of course, the myth out there is that, oh, these medicines are addicting. I don't want my child to take anything addicting. If you have ADD, you take the right amount, it works. You take more than that, it doesn't feel good. 
there's mm-hmm. no incentive to keep taking more. You don't get high. You right. feel, you'll calm down. You can think of things. It's people who don't have ADD take it. Man, they feel great. And they're off to the races. And pretty soon one doesn't work. I need to take two. Yeah. Those are the people who can get addicted to it. I don't think someone who truly has actual ADHD, inattentive or hyperactive combined, can become addicted to a stimulant. Because there's no incentive to keep taking more and more. I just talked to a mom whose 34-year-old daughter was diagnosed with ADHD. And she said, I just don't want her to have depend on those, which is the same as saying addicted to, right? So I said to her, take off your glasses. I said, how do you see? I don't see very well. I said, put them back on. I said, are you addicted to your glasses? She finally got it. It finally clicked for her. But the other piece of that is a lot of substance abuse issues early on before diagnosis are related to self-medication. Am I right about that? (laughs) When we treat it in youngsters, we lower the later addiction rates down to the background level, which depending on your definitions run around 20% when Mm -hmm. you consider cigarettes. Treating it isn't a cure for every impulsivity, but to take it from 50% down to 20% is remarkable. If people know that there's a good treatment, they're much less likely to settle for a poor treatment. Mm. There's a pretty high percentage of folks with ADHD who are treated successfully with medication. Is it more like 70? 80. 80 percent? Yeah, that's great. I think honestly that noncompliance is more of an issue with ADHD than taking too much medication. People forget. That's yeah. another comeback is if it's so addicting, then why are mothers all over the country arguing with their teenagers trying to get them to take it this morning? <laughs> right. Let's talk about adults, though, because even adults forget. It's not it's somebody nagging us. Someone who's been taking it for a year, two, three, and yes. then they go on vacation, and they forgot it, or they ran out and they didn't pick up their prescription, whatever. And they come in and say, I know it's working because I took it again. Or, Ah. boy, I was all over the place. And, oh, yeah, I didn't take any today. After you've been taking it, that becomes the new normal, just what you're used to. Absolutely. Which gets us back to your first question, Linda, which is, why does it hide in adulthood? The answer is because people don't go to the doctor and say, nothing changed. Can you diagnose and treat that? (laughs) That's yeah. what it's like to have as an adult. Nothing's changed. Can you diagnose and treat that? We always go to the doctor when something just tanked. Right. People know when the pain in their shoulder after an injury is gone. You can call them up on the phone and say, hey, did the physical therapy work? And they say, yeah, I'm combing my hair and brushing. I've got range of motion. The pain's gone. Everybody knows what the baseline is. But when you treat AD, you have to get comfortable with the fact that people don't know where they're going with the treatment. It took me a long time to get my arms around that kind of treatment. We Mm -hmm. just don't have models for it in medicine. So for me, it was perimenopause. It's like the hormones went crazy. And finally I said, okay, now I'm going to take the HG medications. He said, no, you need estrogen. And I'm like, okay, that's a whole different story. But why do most people come to you, especially the inattentive diagnosed folks? What happens for a lot of people? Is it menopause? Is it kids? What is it for a later life? I think it's crisis. They're in crisis. I'm about to lose my job, job, or my marriage is falling apart. And my spouse, my therapist, whatever said, ADHD, can you treat me so the marriage doesn't fail? I'm thinking, yeah. dude, you're about 10 years too late <laughs> because it's not going to make everything go If it has been 10 years, the spouse has a lot of resentment build up and thinking, how come I have to tell you this all the time? So even like neurotypical people, the guy forgets to do something or forgets a conversation. She's immediately, see, you're doing it. The crisis is when it becomes more evident. The ideal time is as soon as anybody brings up the thought, you may have ADHD. The person with it, even after diagnosis, isn't aware of how many times they do things or that something's still there. But as soon as someone, an observer, brings it up, check it out. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's go back to inattentive ADHD. I've always heard more girls and women have inattentive ADHD than men or boys. What's your experience with inattentive ADHD? Combined is still fairly common. It's it's less common in adults than it is in children. I've only once in my life diagnosed somebody with hyperactive, but yeah. not inattentive. I had hyperactivity, but not inattention. He was 
a farmer and an insurance salesman and his whole family was loud and active <laughs> and, and so he had a boisterous and good life but when he got parkinson's he was trapped uh, the hyperactivity was driving him crazy yeah yeah that was the first time that the hyperactivity really caused impairment yes. with there's a lot of ways as an adult to sublimate to use to redirect hyperactivity mm. those, those of us who are inattentive i'll speak for myself may envy the energy the inattentive symptoms are much more disabling in adults that's the problem you have all kinds of hand holding you have all kinds of support as a child and that you... disappear suddenly the lack of centeredness of willful direction of thoughtful action of considered plans starts becoming especially notable uh, it, it can hide behind supportive parents up through college okay. Yeah, absolutely. And suddenly in college, students realize that they don't have good habits if somebody's not writing them to have good habits. Right. Fast forward to adulthood with that. What happens in adulthood? Does a spouse or a partner then take that place? Sounds like a bad well, place. Not usually it's on a, a nagging basis. It's hard to have a healthy relationship with that as a basis because it's more parent-child and you just don't want to infect your marriage with that dynamic. It's hard mm -hmm. to have an adult relationship yes. with yes. reminders as frequently as people with inattention need reminders. Yeah. Yeah. And I had one um, mother of a child and I see a, a child be excused and she looked at me and said, how do I deal with having three children in the family? Kids yeah. and my husband. Yeah. And it was because she had to remind him one thing, do you have your lunch? All those kinds of things mm -hmm. that an adult should have. I wanted to get back to one thing. I think in high school, particularly, a lot of girls will overcompensate or they compensate for their procrastination, not getting good grades and whatever. They are going to stay up as late as necessary to do the homework. They get sleep deprived because they're up till midnight and they have to get up at 5.30 to go to school. Boys give up at 7.30 and go play video games. So their grades tank, they're identified. Girls have good grades. I get so frustrated with schools and say, oh, well, you have good grades. You can't have AD. You don't need accommodations. And yeah, but the girl's studying till 1130 at night. She's not able to do any social clubs. She's not in any sports because mm -hmm. she's spending her whole time studying. That's an impairment, but school doesn't see that. Absolutely. And not to mention the fact that sleep deprivation can cause ADHD-like symptoms. Sleep is huge. I think that's absolutely foundational for all of us. Big okay. problem for people with ADHD. Because that <laughs> I've got to do one more thing before I go to bed. Before I go to bed. Or before I go out the door, or before I do anything. Yes. <laughs> one more thing. It's only going to take a sec to wash the dishes, then you wonder why you're 10 minutes late to wherever. One of the things that I hear often is about the stigma of ADHD. Some people don't want to hear it. I talk to a lot of women whose husbands, but could be a wife as well, who say, oh, I don't have ADHD. And the one who's diagnosed says, oh, yes, you do. <laughs> but they don't want the stigma attached to that. Can you address stigma of ADHD, especially later in life? There's a lot of jokes about ADHD. Do we cringe? Do we join in? Do we say, no, I have it? It's a really good point. I think we have to return to first principles. If somebody said, don't diagnose me with asthma, I don't want the stigma. Right. We would say, no, you need to know you have asthma. Yeah. Well, the mortality rate in ADHD, children, adults, all ages is twice baseline. In asthma, it's one and a half times baseline. Wow. In medicine, we have to reduce deaths. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. morbidity. And yeah. thinking that this is a school time disorder misunderstands oh, what, what's really happening. Control mechanisms don't work. Kids are at risk for bullying, for being bullied, for anxiety, for depression. They're at a much higher risk for PTSD, which is something I wish we had more time to talk about because that's another one of the things that we yes. see so much of yes. in adults with ADHD. The adverse childhood trauma index that's now getting the research it deserves shows us that children with ADHD experience more trauma. ADHD seems to be driven by trauma, but having ADHD seems to drive even more trauma. Wow. There's no level at which failing to diagnose this makes any sense. 
Exactly. I, I think we can help people with the stigma, but we need to keep them alive. We need to keep them safe. We need to help them realize how much treatment can make a difference, what a more optimal life might look like. Mm -hmm. what their own potential is if they've given up on it long ago. That's the danger of ADHD in adulthood. People might have uh, lost hope, might mm -hmm. have forgotten the potential they always felt, but that they never saw yeah. despair and, yeah, and just loss of hope. Re restoring hope is important, letting people know that there's a lot of brain tissue that would like to be there for you we can probably get it working without affecting all the other brain tissue that's gotten you here already. Huge yeah. circuit tracks that are really important that aren't operating, but you could have them. You could have access to them. You could use them when they make sense and you can use the ones you've already got. Yeah. You don't have to lose who you are to treat ADHD. All the things that are good versus, again, what are your worries? Who is going to stigmatize you? Where do you think that's going to come from? Mm. Your spouse said you, they think certainly they are going to welcome it. Yeah. Your boss or people at work, they don't need to know. Your parents, well, if you're 43, live your own life. You don't have to who they think you ought to be. Exactly. Uh, is it your friends? Some of them might have recognized it, but they didn't want to say something to you. <laughs> I agree, Thorn, the hope. Hope definitely outweighs any stigma, at least that we can see, but that person is stuck in the stigma part. That's one of the myths. Oh, I don't want right. to take medicine. I'm going to be seen as an addict or yeah. people look down on me. Many people who don't have AD will say, yeah, I procrastinate and I daydream. And does that mean I have eight with ADD? It's six or seven or eight things all together happening and over a long time. It's not every once in a while or two. It's a lot of them. And they started back in childhood. I think procrastinate was the first multi-syllable word I used <laughs> or I knew of because my mother said, are you procrastinating? I said, what's that? What is that? Yeah. <laughs> I just do and it. I, I don't know what the word means. My father oh. said, how many times do I have to tell you? I would absolutely never say, well, I guess, as many as it takes, <laughs> not be the right thing. Okay. That was exactly it. It's how many gloves are you going to use lose in the winter? Uh, you make a good point. When I was diagnosed, and as I began to learn more and more about ADHD, it began to be a rearview mirror kind of thing. So that was ADHD. I mean, I wasn't just a bad person. Oh, that was ADHD. That's what I'm hearing from you as well. I have a patient who's probably a very good example of the question you asked. A tiny energetic, joyful grandma of 80 something mm. that I diagnosed with ADD. Mm -hmm. She came back one month later on medication mm -hmm. and said, I have to tell you something. I did not know this was ADD, but I love spending time with my grandchildren. I love being helpful. So I drive them around, but I've always had a rule that they have to sit in the back seat with headphones on listening to music because I can't have them interrupting me. <laughs> she said, now they can sit in the front seat and we listen to the radio together. Treating ADD gave me time with my grandchildren. Oh, oh, nice. yeah. oh that's, so that's a kind of freedom that you just can't pay for. I have clients who are also in their 80s and their physicians have said, we can't give you stimulants anymore because you're too old. What do each one of you say about that? That's absolutely wrong. Again, <laughs> this speaks to some of the myths physicians have. They are well-meaning. I don't want you to put you at risk for heart problems. A huge study, I think it was 2.1 million people in Denmark plus 1.8 million in the U.S. There was zero increase in cardiovascular events from taking stimulants. That's important. Yeah, indeed. Or is there something you'd like to add? Absolutely. Your There's always a balance of risk and benefit. Mm -hmm. But the a few people do have heart problems, they're at risk to have physicians that can monitor their cardiac health. Yeah, I use a lot of non-stimulants too. One of the things that I've found is that if you use low-dose non-stimulants in combination with low-dose stimulants, that you often get away with low side effects. Yeah. If somebody can't be on a dose that they can't stand, we just cut it back to a dose they can stand. Yeah. Give it some time and then add a low dose stimulant. There's still impairments, but this grandma wound up taking a low dose stimulant. Mm -hmm. 
along with the low doses for sure. What's the most important thing that you want to leave our audience with? I'm just going to echo what you've already said, Linda, what David's already said. It's never too late to diagnose AD. And the positives that you gain from it are unimaginable when you have ADD. You can't know what it's like to have parts of your brain online that have never been online for you. That's why I believe everybody should do a trial of therapy, just like people should try psychotherapy, should get their sleep cycle together, should get an exercise program going, should eat some kind of whole foods, more nutritious diet than last year, a little bit every year, should begin some form of meditation, even if it's a minute of breathing here and there, and discover all the things that are possible without ever changing your personality, but really watching it flower, watching it enlarge, watching it mature and grow. So it's never too late. Stigma is the last of your worries. It's what you're missing. Exactly. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Lauren. David, sing us out, why don't you? <laughs> I think that many people miss, particularly with first diagnosis. Oh, okay, now I've got to be like this. And if I take medicines, that's going to reduce my creativity one thing or another one of the strengths of ad we have what i term an associational mind mm. we can remember this little fact and this one and then that relates to this so we put things together that other people who are sequential have to go one step at a time they can't see where we're going to get to they may get there eventually <laughs> maybe that's partly why people with ad are good entrepreneurs. We think, oh, there's this. Gee, that might work. Then, of course, when it comes to keep the business going, you sell it and let someone else do that. <laughs> so I'd say go with your passion. Mm -hmm. Be doing something you really enjoy and convince someone to pay you for it. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Orrin Mason, Dr. David Pomeroy. I learned a lot today, and I'm so glad that you were able to share in their wisdom. This has been a production of Inattentive ADHD Coalition. Check us out at iadhd.org and see how you can help us by donating or by spreading awareness about inattentive ADHD. Thank you.